The following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning, people of God. It is a great, glorious thing. We're so grateful to be able to have this opportunity to help start your day here at Grace and Glory, Baltimore's number one gospel program because of you. We are so grateful for that also. And we're always grateful for having the opportunity to inspire and encourage and empower. And since I'm on this grateful tip, I am grateful for our guest today, a dear friend, Pastor Francis Tony Draper, publisher of the Afro-American newspaper. Tony, how are you? Grateful. <laughs> good morning. It's so good to see you. You look great. Thank you. Thank you so much. God is good. You know, I'm trying to catch up with you because you've been retired now for some time. So maybe you can give a, a, a young kid like me uh, some, some pointers. I'm in, I'm in progress. I'm retiring. I'm full time at the Afro. Retiring. Okay. <laughs> retired from pastoring, but not from working. Similar here, but I understand for Black History Month, you brought some interesting information to share with us, right? I really did. Okay, well, we're looking forward to it. Let's hold on to it right there, okay? And we're going to come right back after our first spoken word. Bishop Dante Hickman joining us over at Southern Baptist Church right here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. By the time of our text, my dear brothers and sisters, David had come up to the battle between the armies of Israel and the Philistines to bring his brothers some lunch as he was directed by his father, Jesse. This seemed like a very menial task for David, given the fact that he had just been selected, set apart and anointed by Samuel in the previous chapter to become the next king of Israel. Read chapter 16. And you'll clearly see that it was by the divine providence of God and in the witnessing company of his father and his brothers that he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. Yet, in the very next chapter of his life, this recently anointed to be the next king young man was sent on an errand to bring his brothers some lunch. Subsequently, what the text is tailored to teach us is that no matter what you have been anointed and destined to be, it all starts with humility. Somebody shout humility. This was an important demonstration because so many of us long to be up without ever learning how to be down. We want to be in charge of others without first being in control of ourselves. We want to be served without being a servant. We want to be a father without first being a son. Nevertheless, while Jesse knew who David was anointed and destined to become, he did not allow him to abort his process of becoming. After all, it was his humble and faithful service as a shepherd that positioned him to become the next king. You see, many of us, when God is elevating us, we seem to lose understanding of what God saw in us to elevate us in the first place. All of a sudden, we see ourselves as king when we ought to be maintaining our perspective as shepherd boy. And now in the process of being a door dasher to his brothers at the battlefront, he naturally discovered his passion and his purpose as a kingdom leader. To be clear, church, David was not looking for a fight, but the fight of God was just in him like that. He was going up there humbly to serve his brother's lunch when he heard Goliath yelling obscenities 
to the armies of Israel and about his God. And David became incensed. Who is he talking to? And who is he talking about? I know he ain't talking about my God. When I think about all he's done, I know he ain't talking about my God. And David immediately wanted to engage and get involved to take down this giant. You see, he wasn't looking for the fight, but the fight for God was just in him. I think that's important because a lot of people are wannabes. They're wannabes because they see somebody else's swag and somebody else's success and being who they are born and called to be. And they want to be like them because of what they see and what it does for them. So goes the adage, monkey see, monkey do. In the book, Leaders Are Made Not Born, Michael Farlow attempts to give us the skills and the devices to make us effective leaders. He says, listen here, you may not have all of this naturally, but let me give you some qualities and skills that will help you to be who you want to be as an effective leader. And while I believe that we can learn leadership, it is impossible to teach instinctiveness, innate inspiration, integrity, and initiative. There are just some things that some people just have naturally without the need for nurturing. And no matter how you try to limit them, they will always bloom, blossom, and shine in their season without even trying. This was David's season, and the next step towards his divine succession plan. And, and it wasn't planned by man. It was just purposed in his heart, and it manifested at an unexpected but necessary time. Let me unpack that so you can get it. Whoever God made you and called you to be, will have an opportune time to be when it is required of you to be. You ain't gotta rush it. You ain't gotta manipulate it. You ain't gotta knock nobody upside the head. You don't have to wear a t-shirt. Whoever God has made you and called you to be will have the right moment and the right time when it is required of you to be what's already on the inside of you. But in the words of Hamlet, as written by William Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question. Hamlet was agonizing over how painful and miserable human life is and how death, specifically suicide, would be preferable, would it not be for the fearful uncertainty of what comes after death? I want to die, but I can't die, because if I do die, what might come after I die might be worse than before I die. And David, hearing the insults to his God from Goliath, and seeing the fear of the armies of God of Goliath evoked that same agony of life and death. Knowing what was in his heart to do could not be avoided. You see, people who lead, people who take risks, people who fight against overwhelming odds don't do so whimsically, but intrinsically, they battle. They fight on the inside to be or not to be, to go or not to go, to do or not to do. I know I make it look sexy. I know 
I make it look easy. But it is not easy being me. Come on, help me preach. Look at your neighbor and tell him it ain't easy being me. I know you see my swag. I know you see my success. I know you see how good I look on the outside. But somebody shout, it ain't always like that on the inside. And fortunately for us, in most instances, God's will wins the day. And that's why we're able to reflect on our ancestors and rejoice that they made the courageous choice to be. Every one of them that did great things did not do it because they were looking for self-aggrandizement. They weren't looking to be written down in history. Write my name. They did it because they were instinctively and innately inspired and called to do it. And when the moment came, they chose to be. But what is distressing beyond the stressing is the resistance we are met with not from the opposing team, but from family, friends, colleagues, and saints from among our own ranks. When David inquired about the giant and what would be given to the man who killed him, the other men and soldiers gave him the respect of a response. But his elder brother Elliot that he brought lunch for went off on him and gave him a rebuke. What did you come up here for? And who did you leave them little sheep with? I know your pride. I know your insolence. I know your arrogance. You ain't fooling me. Anybody got a family member like that? And let me park parenthetically to say, that it's always the people closest to you. And the ones you do the most for who betray you, backstab you, and beat you down in the presence of others. David's presence and passion to fight the giant exposed his brother's maddening envy. Somebody shout envy. His older brother, his anger was aroused against him and said, why did you come down here? Now notice, Eliab chose to be angry with his brother rather than to be inspired by his brother. And when we consider the tone and the tenor of his words, they really manifested his animosity. And that this was more than about Goliath and the war. Maybe Eliab is getting off of his chest. The injustice he felt in chapter 16. When his little brother got chosen over him to be the next king. You remember Samuel had all the boys to pass by. And he said the Lord has chosen none of these. Oh, Eliab was strapping, he was fine, he was gorgeous, he was strong. But little old David, little scrawny shepherd boy, God, God said, that's the one. Anoint him. Not the one that looks the part, but the one who is the part from the inside out. And while Eliab's name meant God is my father, and he was the apple of his earthly father's eye, he was just not God's choice to be the next king. And his envy and example in this text is the evidence why. You see, people will eventually expose why they weren't chosen for the job. Preach, Dante. You can't be mad about somebody else's favor. How you gonna be the king and you emotionally riddled and upset 
about something that didn't even happen yet for somebody else that is in your family. What you can do is be glad about your own favor. Come on, help me preach. Look at somebody and tell them, be glad about your own favor. If you spend time thinking about your favor rather than the favor of others, you won't have room or energy to be hating on nobody else. Here, here, here's the hard question. Here's the hard question. Ask the person beside you, can you be good without being great? Go ahead. Can you be good? Without being next, let, let me go ahead and fess up. I'm happy with what I have and with what I can do. Child, this week I was reflecting and I looked over my life and I said, Dante, you don't have a lot of what your other colleagues have. You may not have this, you may not have that, but boy, you got enough to take care of your family. You got enough to keep a roof over your head. I mean, I mean, one of the rooms in my house was is bigger than the house I grew up in. Y'all ain't helping me preach. I can only drive one car at a time. I can only wear one pair of shoes at a time. And when I get hungry, I always got something to eat. I got a church that loves me and I can come and preach to. I'm still in my right mind after all the stuff that has happened to me that should have made me crazy. I thank God for what I have and what I can do. And I ain't jealous of none of y'all. David's presence and passion to fight the giant exposed his brother's maddening envy. I ain't gonna get through all of this, but it also exposed his misplaced energy. What I find very interesting is Eliab's overwhelming willingness to fight his little brother rather than the giant. You got me. Where is the vitriol and venom for Goliath. Why be jealous about who you are not when you are not even being who you are? How can you be a king and you're not even a good soldier? Maybe you need to take Booker T. Washington's advice and cast your buckets where you are. And to add insult to injury, this is what happens to us in our own communities. Rather than fight the systems of our oppression, we fight with and for the system in keeping our own communities oppressed. Rather than build our cities, we, we kill each other for a corner. It's easier for us to bully each other rather than beat the giants by being educated fiscally responsible, socially involved, family oriented, politically engaged, and spiritually grounded. Subsequently, we have to know who our real enemies are and use all of our energy, resources, and skills to defeat the giants that want to divide us and destroy us. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I'm not your enemy. Nevertheless, I'm about done. What I love about David is that he did not internalize the insults. He demonstrated that you can't allow other people's problems and their problems with you to become your problem. Oh my God. Help me preach right quick. Tell your neighbor, your problem is really not my problem. Oh my God, you, you should have said that thing like you meant it. Because some people bring all of their issues to you and if you're not careful, you'll receive all of that stuff. But you got to learn how to look at them and say within yourself, your problem is not my problem. Instead of internalizing the insult, David insisted on using his influence to make a difference. And as a result, oh my God, the destined to be king was brought to the king. James, do you hear me? He came 
to bring lunch, but now he's lunching with the king. That, 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 that's how God does it every time. He didn't come to see the king. He came to bring lunch to his brothers. But when you're faithful to who you are and who God called you to be, he will raise you up and you don't even know you're going to be up today. Life just takes you to where you were created and called to be. David was now preparing to live in his purpose. But Dante, how do you live in your purpose when you are looked down on as powerless? God has called you. God has chosen you. God has commissioned you. But the people around you, including your family and so-called friends, don't take you serious. They ridicule you. They reduce you and they remind you of your past and all your problems. And before you know it, you feel undervalued, underappreciated, and underestimated. And you quit before you win. But I'm preaching this sermon because the undervalued, the underappreciated, and the underestimated is precisely the people and predicament that God can use to perform a powerful work and break the back of the devil. So that David demonstrated that in order to overthrow giants, you have to first overcome what other people think about you. And you overcome what other people think about you by focusing on your assignment from God. I didn't think I was gonna get here. Look at somebody, tell them focus on your assignment. David said in verse 29, what? have I done now? It's obvious that old Big E had talked down to him before. He like, every time I turn around, you got something to say negative to me. I was out in the backyard, minding my own business, and you still on my case. What have I done now? But then he goes further. Is there not a cause? David was offended by what was offensive to his God. And his assignment in that moment was developed from that entanglement. This is going to get deep. Subsequently, what offends you finds you, defines you, and refines you. Some of us are offended by the wrong thing. Some of us are offended by boundaries, and that's why you by yourself and don't nobody want to be bothered with you. <laughs> Some of us are offended by challenges, and that's why we're limited in our lives right now. Some of us are offended by correction, and that's why we're trapped. Some of us are offended by discipline, and that's why we're broke and we're broken. So ask the person beside you, what offends you? Go ahead. And if it ain't high enough, you are too low enough. That, that's what Eliab didn't get, that it wasn't about him. And it wasn't about a position. With the threat of Trump, I mean Goliath, this was about. This was about the purpose and the principles of the kingdom. This ain't about who's talking about who on Club Shay Shay. This is about a cause that will determine the future of our children and our children's children. What offends you then can become your assignment or your confinement. What offends you can become your appointment or your disappointment. What offends you can become your rise or it can become your fall. Can I preach another point? says if you're going to overcome what people think about you, you got to focus on your assignment from God and then you got to focus on your affirmation from God. That's what verse 30 says and I'm going to end it here. You just got to tune in at the next service but I feel like shouting. I feel my help coming. Look at somebody and tell them you got to focus on your affirmation 
from God. That, that's what verse 30 says. It says, then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Some of y'all missed it. Do you see what David just did? Do you see what he just did when his brother insulted him? When his brother attacked him? When his brother tried to look down on him? Do you see what he did? Y'all don't see what he did. I'm going to tell you what he did. The Bible says it right there. He turned from him to another. David didn't get caught up with his brother on a personal and petty level. No, the Bible says he shifted the conversation to the cause and then he turned from him to another. And I'm trying to preach to somebody that sometimes all you have to do to maintain your cool with a fool is just turn from him and turn to another. When people are going off on you and saying all manner of disrespectful things to you, all you gotta do is turn from them and turn to another. When somebody tells you you can't make it and you can't take it and you can't shake it and you can't break it, all you gotta do if you know they stabbing you in your back, if you know they lying on you, if you know they are backstabbing you, if you know you they, they ain't trying to help you, all you gotta do is turn from them and turn to another. The Bible says uh, that, that you are not even let your energy or let their energy give you a contact high. I wish I had a witness in here because negative people are like smoke that come from weed. Uh, negative people are like you can't get caught up in that contact. That energy will get you low like them. You got to turn from them and turn to another and whatever you need to understand is that when God gives you an assignment that he will also provide affirmation and confirmation in the places and the spaces that you find yourself in look at your neighbor and just tell him you just got to keep turning from them to another because your affirmation is in the room somebody shout my my affirmation is in the room. That's why I like coming to church and particularly this church because I know I'm going to get my amen. I'm going to get my amen in a prayer. I'm going to get my amen in a song. I'm going to get my amen in a sermon. I'm going to get my amen in a testimony. And I'm going to get my amen in a praise. You got to learn how to turn from the nonsense sense and listen for your amen you got to learn how to turn from the negatives and listen for your amen you got to learn how to turn from your naysayers and listen for your amen and while his brother didn't give him the answer that he needed somebody else did I'm about to shut it down when I tell you your amens ain't coming from the people that you want them to come from but your amens are coming slap high five with your neighbor and tell them your amens are coming and the best amen is your own amen that enables you to say like David I will go and I will fight have I got a witness here oh I see why y'all sitting there cause you want me to preach this good sermon to the end so I might as well give you point number three look at your neighbor and say neighbor you can overcome what people think about you when you focus on your assignment from God when you focus on your affirmation from God but then finally when you focus on your assistance from God You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. Welcome back. Thank you, uh, Bishop Hickman and uh, Pastor, uh, well, Pastor Emeritus, uh, uh, Tony uh, Draper. So good to have you with us again. And, uh, you know, it's Black History Month, and uh, I can't think of 
a greater institution as it relates to the no local presence with national implications than the Afro-American newspaper of which your family started. Thank you. Yes, my great-grandfather started it in 1892. We laugh about the founding a little bit because it's with venture capital from my great-grandmother, $200. So the women in the family say that she loaned him the $200. <laughs> $200. <laughs> the men in the family said, no, no, they were one. So, And this was back in? 1892. 1892. So the name, Lee, was already in existence. Really? And so the name and a printing press were up for auction. Right. Uh, you told me about that. Uh, a church, pastors? They were pastors. The pastor of Sharon Baptist Church. Uh huh. Um, the Reverend William Alexander. Okay. And the pastor of the St. James Episcopal Church, Father George Bragg. Um, they had really started this enterprise. And they had the printing press? They had the printing press. They were printing a feed sheet. <laughs> <laughs> for farmers? To advertise feed for animals wow. in Baltimore. But they were better pastors than they were printers. <laughs> and thank God for you guys, right? So uh, uh, your, your great-grandfather, uh, with the uh, financing of your great-grandmother, uh, launched the paper. What was it like in those early years? I can only imagine he was 52 years old, had been enslaved, served as a sergeant in the Civil War, and they had 10 children. Wow, that's amazing. And yet, you know, now we 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 move forward, and we look at how the African American, or the Afro American newspaper, has been a staunch institution in the story and the journey of a people, particularly in this area, but not uh, to uh, be excluded from the national platform. It's a national publication. Very much a national publication and international now. Uh, with all of the technology and the way that we do news. We're not a newspaper anymore. We're a media company. Uh, wow. Now, with that, over the course of all of these years, since uh, 1892, uh, there has been an accumulation of quite a bit of content, hasn't there? So much content. Um, we have three million photographs in our archive. Three million? Three million. Amazing. We have bound volumes of earlier papers. We have things like an audio recording of my grandfather, Carl, and Thurgood Marshall talking about the Brown versus Board of Education. Amazing. That's, um, brief. We have all kinds of correspondence, letters between folk at the Afro and people now that we revere um, in history. Speaking of which, it just so happened that I have in my hand a letter, uh, two letters, and you can share with uh, our viewers these letters. The first, uh, uh, is uh, uh, addressed to, I believe, your great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. Uh, Mr. Murphy, it says, I've just read your very generous editorial, and it goes on talking about the story of the Negro, and it's signed Booker T. Washington. We have several Booker T. Washington letters in the collection. This particular letter I find of interest because it's so relevant now to 2024. Uh -huh. um, and this is dated December 23, 1909. 1909 where he's urging my great-grandfather to talk to people uh, in the school system to teach wow. our history. Wow, sounds very familiar. Very familiar. Amazing. Now the other letter uh, is addressed to your great-grandfather and it says, I have your letters and I'm bringing the matter to the attention of Dr. Springarn. That name sounds familiar. Right, for whom the Spingarn Medal. Yes, came. yes, yes. And this one is signed W.E.B. Du Bois. Yeah, Dr. Du Bois or Du Bois, depending on how, yeah. you know, how it's pronounced, lived here in Baltimore. Now, I didn't know that. Where? In Morgan Park. He lived in Baltimore. He, so he and my grandfather were contemporaries. Amazing. And you said you've got, like this, uh, over three million pieces between photographs and, and letters and, and well, Three million photographs. Letters three million are, photographs. The letters are separate. Amazing. Now, how, that, that's a treasure. And Absolutely. yet the public, you know, how can the public well, access well, it? Well, we're working now, so a little a plug here. If they go to afrocharities.org, uh -huh. you can see more of the history of the archives. But we are actually redeveloping the Upton Mansion on West Landville Street. Yes. Going back to our roots. Okay. To be a permanent um, home for the archives as well as the Afro newspaper's um, headquarters. So okay. Afro Charities, our 501 C three is developing this. So so the public will be at that time able, able to, to come in and see. Yeah, that's the purpose, that the public will be able to come in and to handle those materials. But now the public can go to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. If you have a library card uh -huh. and go to the historical newspaper database, you can research the Afro from eighteen ninety three to the 
to the present. That, that is amazing. Some we're talking what about three or four gener four generations of, of your family? family. I'm fourth generation. We have fifth generation, and the sixth generation person will be a year old in a couple of months. It's amazing. So what? What? Or seventh what, generation rather. We have, that, so yes. the Afro today. You did kind of allude to it a little bit uh, as uh, as it relates to the international uh, platform with content. What What is the mission statement of the Afro today? Well, the mission statement of the Afro is still to uplift our people, um, to, to write stories around our accomplishments, our, our strengths, as well as our struggles, right? right? And it's also to do it in a format that appeals to people across age groups. Sometimes we hear a newspaper and we think, ah, oh, old legacy, right. let's just look at the archives. No, we're not that. We are over a million um, followers on social media combined between all of the So platforms. you put a lot of emphasis on in, in embracing the new platforms for oh, absolutely. Dis you distributing have to. your content. You have to. The, the methods change. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't care what part of history But the message in. hasn't. The message, well, the message changes some. Okay. But the relevancy of the message has not changed. That's good. Listen, I want you to stick with us for just a second. We've got the break for our second spoken word, Dr. Kenneth Robinson, Dream Life Worship Center. Then we'll close out. Man, this is rich. I hope you're enjoying it right here on Grace and Glory. Stay tuned. Dream Life Worship Center brings you an uplifting message for you to trust God. And a life that is complete. The way God made you is the way God wants you to be. Everything about your your, your, um, not everything about your personality, not everything, but the way God wired you, the way he uniquely put your DNA together, the way you, the way you interact, the way you interface, the way you, the way you, uh, engage in the world is the way God uniquely made you so that you can accomplish what he has for you to do. You can do things that I will never be able to do. I can do some things that you'll never be able to do like you do them. And so this way it's the will of God for us to flourish. Some things that you thought you wouldn't be able to do, you will flourish in them this year. Some things that you thought were over in your life, you will flourish in them this year. Some things that you thought you were counted out for, you will flourish in them this year. Some things that you thought you were too old for, you will flourish in them this year, okay? Some things that you thought you didn't have enough resources for, you will flourish in them this year. Some of the things that you thought that you didn't have the connections for, you will flourish in them this year. Come on, somebody. Because it's the will of God for you to flourish. You're not like everybody else. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not regular. You and I are not regular. Pastor Joni, God bless you. We love you. We're not regular. You're not a regular person. I'm not a regular person. I'm not just a nobody trying to tell everybody. About somebody that could change in your body. No, 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 no. I, I understand the sentiment. The sentiment is humility. But that's just like the enemy. He'll take, he'll take a, 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 a godly um, attribute, humility, and he'll turn it and use it against you to now why you think you're a nobody. No, we're not regular. We are, we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are set aside and set apart by God to be used, uh, uh, to be used by God. And as a matter of fact, we are ambassadors. We actually, we're travelers. Come on, somebody. We, I, mm, they used to sing, I'm just a stranger here, traveling through. We are ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who has governmental authority going to another country, another place, another a geographic location to accomplish, come on, an official tax. Somebody say, I'm official. So we are, we are ambassadors. We are kings. We are priests. As a matter of fact, we're, we're, I'm not, somebody say, I'm not even sitting where you think I'm sitting. I'm sitting in heavenly places. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell them it looks like I'm looking. It looks like I'm sitting next to you, but I'm really sitting in heavenly places. We, we are on, I just want to remind you for a few minutes, and I'm getting into the text. We, 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 are, we are called uh, to live on another dimension. 
We are called to live in a, from another realm. Do y'all hear me? You, you and I, we are, we, 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 our physical bodies are here, but we operate in another realm. We operate from another posture. We operate from, from another kingdom, another dimension. Did you hear what I'm saying today? You and I, we are not regular. Somebody say, I'm not regular. So this is why we have to flourish. The word flourish here in the original is parak. It's used, um, it's used several times throughout this, this text and even throughout the entire books of the Psalms. But it means to break forth. It means to bud, to sprout, to blossom, to bloom, to spread. That's what flourish means, to break forth, to bud, to sprout to blossom, to, bro to, to bloom, or to spread. He says in the text, he said, the righteous flourish. So you, 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 you have to understand who you are in order, in order to flourish. We are the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, it reminds us that we are the righteousness of God because he made him, God made him who knew no sin, Come on, to become sin on our behalf so that we might become what? The righteousness of God. So I'm the righteousness of God. And because I am the righteousness of God, then I am entitled to flourish. That means that no, there should be in my life nothing, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing empty, and nothing broken. Somebody say, well, that's just unrealistic. Well, that's, is it working for you? Well, that, that, no, no, that's just too much because we all got the dead, dead. Well, you go head on. If that's been working for you, then you keep doing that. But as for me, I am the righteousness of God. Come on. And any place I see in my life that's missing, lacking, empty, and broken, I'm going to prophesy to it. Can these dry bones live? Did you hear what I said? Because I'm done. I'm done arguing and debating with believers who don't believe. Y'all are not my sequel. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to try to. Because here's the fruit. Here's the evidence. This is what y'all need to start telling y'all uncle and them at the next barbecue. Has that been working for you, unk? How well is that working for you? It's not working for you. And that's why you, and, and here's the thing. When you don't, when we as believers don't believe, we are really believing in our unbelief. When we don't believe that we are, we are uh, 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 entitled because of our right, not because of you, not because of me, but because I am the righteousness of God, I can claim this and I can flourish in every area of my life. And when we don't believe it, I don't believe all that, I don't believe all that. Well, that's, you do believe, you believe in your unbelief. And I refuse to waste my power to believe, come on somebody, on something that does not work. I refuse, come on, to use my power and my energy and put my faith in something, come on, that does not cause me to flourish. And so he says, you are like a palm tree. He said, the righteous flourish like a a palm tree. The palm tree here represents grace. A palm tree represents grace. A palm tree is beautiful. A palm tree is majestic. If you, if you, if you're going, I wish I was somewhere right now actually looking at a palm tree. When, you, when you're flying in over something and you see some palm trees, you be listen. You be like, listen here. Let me get my flip-flops ready. A palm tree is beautiful. It is majestic. It is about, about uh, 20 years ago or so, they were building a housing development in Texas, 
and it was called Savannah. Savannah, like a, a little mini, the theme was Savannah, Georgia, and there are palm trees in Savannah, Georgia. And so it was called Savannah, and they were building this housing uh, community. And when you walked up this, this, this long driveway and this big sign, and they had planted palm trees up and down this driveway into this, this uh, community center and this where you go, where they go get your money, where they go to, you know, to build the house. And they had, they had built palm trees all up and down there. And I thought to myself, now how is a palm tree going to survive in Texas heat? That's what I said to myself, but I'm not a horticulturist, so I didn't know. I just said, if you drive down that highway today, them palm trees are not there. Why? Because a palm tree, take note of this, needs the right environment. A palm tree needs the right environment. And for many of us, we are not flourishing because we are not in the right environment. And God is going to deal with you in the next coming weeks and months about the environments in your life. Y'all better hear me. Some of us, God is delivering us and setting us free from toxic environments. Some of us, God is setting us free from stressful environments. Some of us, God is setting us uh, free from dry, no, oh, oh, from dry environments. A palm tree needs the right environment. Second thing I want you to know about a palm tree is that they need plenty of support. When a palm tree is planted, just like many other trees, it cannot, it cannot stand on its own. It needs plenty of support. It, it, needs, uh, uh, it needs something to lean on until it doesn't need something to lean on. And for this year, those of you who have been lone rangers, I want to prophesy to you that God is sending you supernatural support. Y'all better hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. I said God is sending you supernatural support. No, 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 no. Not just you and the angels in your room by yourself. Come on, somebody. I said, God is sending you human resources. Yes, he is. God is sending you what you need. God is sending you who you can lean on until you don't need to lean on them anymore. A palm tree needs plenty of support. Third thing I want you to see is that palms need regular pruning. Palm needs regular pruning. Have you ever seen a palm tree with a bunch of uh, brown leaves under the bottom and a bunch of green leaves sprouting out on top of them? It's because the brown leaves need pruning. There are things in your life and in my life that God desires to, uh, for us to be stripped off of our lives. Come on. Because why? Because, because it, it's weighing you down. Because why? Because it's sucking the life out of you. Because why? Because watch this, it's making you look bad. Oh, Jesus. It's making you look bad. And they need regular pruning. Pruning is not just a one-time occurrence. Pruning is not something that just happens and you, then you're done. And this is, why, this is why we always have to stay in a place where we can hear from God and hear, come on, what, it, what is it on me that you don't want on me anymore? Come on, somebody. Come on. You, you, you got to be in a place where we're walking with God and we're sensitive to where he has us in the light and See, the pruning process is an uncomfortable process because what, in essence, uh, you're, you're losing something, come on, that used to be alive in your life. You're, using, you're losing something that, that used to be beneficial to you. You're, you're, God is, is removing things, come on, that no longer serve your purpose, palm tree. And dead leaves, come on, do no longer serve your purpose. As a matter of fact, it takes away from your majesty. Come on, somebody. Tell your neighbor, hello, your majesty. So there has to be regular pruning of a palm tree. And the next thing about a palm tree that God plants is that it needs flexibility and resilience. 
Here's the challenge. Some of us are so set in our ways that we're no longer flexible. The challenge is that we are used to doing things a certain way all the time, and we've done them all this way all the time, and this is the way they always did it, and this is the way it used to be, and this is the way, this is the way, this is the way, and God is saying, no, 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 Palm, you got to be flexible. You got to be resilient. You got to be able to move with the synchronization of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, come on, somebody. You cannot mark God. You don't know. Come on. The, the, uh, you, you don't know how God's going to move for you in this season. You can't, you can't mark God for how he moved for you in the last seasons of your life. You've got to be flexible enough to say, okay, God, however you want to do it. Okay, God, however you want to move. Okay, God, however you want to speak. Okay, God, wherever you lead me, I'll go. Okay. Okay, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. I'm flexible. Somebody say I'm flexible. I'm flexible because what God is doing, it don't look like nothing you've seen before. What God is doing in your life is, is unusual. And then they need resilience. Palm trees seek water. The thing about a palm tree, somebody say I'm a palm tree. It seeks water and it has an acute sense of finding water sources. It seeks water, it seeks water, it seeks water, it seeks water. It looks for water, it looks for water, it seeks the Holy Spirit. Y'all ain't caught it yet. A palm tree seeks water, a palm tree thrives, come on, with water. A palm tree lives for water, a palm tree lives for the presence of God. A palm tree lives, come on, it's like a tree that is planted, come on, by the streams of water. Water. A palm tree has an acute sense of where the water is. Come on. This is why God calls us palm trees because he's heightening our senses in the Holy Ghost. Did you hear me? He's hiding our senses in the Holy Ghost to where we know, come on, we, we have a knowing in our knower. Come on, what, where God is, where the water is. And this is what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to the streams of water. He's calling us into his presence. He's calling us into places, come on, that are deeper than the shallow waters that you've been fooling around with. God is calling us to streams of water. A palm tree seeks water. A palm trees, uh, palm trees are even able to thrive in harsh and difficult uh, 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 conditions. Y'all know, I, I don't know how these journalists stand in the middle of these hurricanes. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they do it, but you've seen it where the palm tree is 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 taking a licking. Come on and keep on ticking. You see the palm tree bending in the storm. You see the palm tree bending, come on, with the wind. You see the palm tree bending, but what you don't see is the palm tree breaking. You don't see the palm. You see, you see it bending and you and you wondering. Come on. You wondering if it's going to make it. You looking at CNN like that palm tree, that that palm tree is not going to make it. You'll see it bending, but you won't see it breaking because, watch this, it is able to handle difficult conditions. This is how God, you and I, we have the DNA of a palm tree. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We have the DNA of a palm tree. And we go, this year, I'm not breaking this year. Come on. Come on. I'm not breaking this year. I made a broke last year and a year year before because I didn't understand who I was. It's all right. Uh, say I'm growing up now. I'm growing up now. I'm growing up now. I realize, glory to God, uh, that I'm a palm tree. Uh, and this year I might bend, uh, but don't be looking for me to break. Glory to God. Palm tree is not even made out of wood. 
A palm tree is not made out of wood. A wood snaps. Come on. Wood breaks. Come on. But a palm tree is not even made out of wood. The, the, uh, the writer says that a palm tree is made of cells, fibers, and tissues. A palm tree is just made different. Glory to God. I'm just made different. I'm made different. I'm not even made. I'm sorry that it's not working out for you, but I'm made different. Y'all better, you better learn how to talk back. Come on. Oh, I'm so sorry, auntie. I'm so sorry that it has not worked out for you, but I'm just made different. Now, tell yourself, I'm just made different. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be all right all the time, already all right all the time, already all right all the time. But it means that I'm made different. And I'm not going to break under the pressure. I'm not going to I'm not going to give up and give in and die and lay it down. I'm I'm made for this. I have the DNA. Come on, I have the DNA of God on the inside of me. I have the DNA of the Holy One. I have the DNA. I keep telling you, I'm not a regular person. You're not an ordinary person. Come on. You're not a nobody. You have the DNA of the Holy One on the inside of you. You have the DNA of the one who defied death, hell, and the grave. You have have the DNA of the one who is more than a conqueror. Come on. You have the DNA of the one who conquered it all. Come on. You've got the DNA. Somebody say, it's in me. It's in me. It's in me. It's in you because he said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion. You have time to join us online or in person. Visit DreamLifeWC.com. We would love to see you at the dream. Welcome back. Hope you've enjoyed the program today. I have immensely enjoyed not only the information, but also getting a chance to chat with my friend, Pastor Francis Tony Draper. Thank you so much, Tony, for coming. Listen, before you go with such a rich uh, heritage uh, being left in your care as steward, stewardess of the uh, Afro, what, what would uh, you say to our viewers uh, as an appeal to how they can continue to support the Afro. Okay, thank you for having us here, and I'd like to say it's a team effort. Okay. With our readers and viewers, because we do a lot of video, uh -huh. being a part of the team. Okay. So one thing that people can do is to continue to send their news to us, editor at afro.com, editor at afro.com, okay. they can do that. Another thing that we really want to ask the public to help us with is to build us our subscriber base. That makes sense. And so afro.com, and some of the newsletters don't cost a thing. Okay. You just go and sign up for them. But a full subscription does, and you can get a digital edition okay. for like, you know, less than the cost of two So Uber you can Eats. download it to your phone? You can download it to your phone. You can get, some people like the print edition. I'm okay. amazed people say, I just want the print edition. Okay, so. I still like print. They can do that, and they do the print, they get the digital as a bonus. Okay. Oh, that's good. So they can, and they can support, as I said, the archives. So how do, they, how do they initiate the subscription process? Afro.com. Afro.com. And right at the top of the page it is a big button that says subscribe, big red button. Oh, you can't miss it. can't huh? miss it. Now, you mentioned about Afro Charities. Uh, how can they support that? Afrocharities.org, if you go there, you'll see um, a invitation, an invitation to support. Okay. The, you know, through a donation. That's one way to support. Okay. Because and what we want to do is to also teach the public how to preserve their own archives. Great. And now what's the uh, timeline for the, um, the, uh, the mansion? We're hoping to break ground this year, what? this summer, to okay. break ground and have it open um, 2025, late 2025. That'll be awesome. It will be. It's a national treasure. And I'm looking forward to being there to help celebrate with you. Thank it you. is a national treasure. And you and your family have been a national treasure, and that's why we celebrate you during Black History Month. Appreciate it. Speaking of celebration, I've got one coming up tonight, and I hope that you guys will make plans to join us. Uh, we've heard a lot of encouraging but, uh, uh, chatter, if you would, about the uh, uh, celebration, I was going to say anniversary, a retirement celebration for 
for yours truly at Empowerment Temple. Uh, that's going to be uh, at 6 p.m. Doors open at 5 o'clock. Absolutely free. Hope you'll make it your business to come out and join us. I appreciate you coming to be with us. Uh, much continued success, and we Thank look you. forward to that news, okay? And we'll be covering you tonight. All right. Looking forward to that, too. All right. And we look forward to getting back with you again next week. Until then, remember to always walk in his grace and live in his glory. We look forward to connecting again next week right here on Grace and Glory. Thank you.